Good evening. All right. Caught everybody by surprise. And uh, I am thankful. I got a little sleep, so we're good to go. I won't fall asleep on you. Or, you know, I didn't want to fall asleep during Brother Ray Feld's presentation and message tonight. And uh, so we got a little nap. We're good to go. But uh, glad each of you are here tonight. I just got to share with you all of the things that you don't get to know. And uh, I talked about my tie is crooked, so everyone's texting me, right? My pant leg gets curled, everyone's texting me. So I preached this morning on honoring your pastor, and everyone texted me how good I looked today. I appreciate that. Uh, you guys are a mess, but you're a lot of fun, and I enjoyed all of them, and so thank you for those that participate in making your pastor laugh, and uh, it's all good. We're glad that uh, we have that great relationship. All right, let me, uh, let me give you a couple of announcements that will help you. Super Seniors uh, will be going on Thursday, and uh, looking forward to Meadowbrook House and Garden Tour. And uh, so the super seniors, uh, if you can plan for that. Um, the farewell for the Craigs has been moved from tonight to next Sunday's uh, Faith Family Fellowship. Just works better in, in everyone's schedule, uh, specifically theirs. And so uh, we certainly felt like that could be accommodated. And so, uh, but be praying for the Craigs and their transition. And um, remember that the junior uh, campers will be taking off for the UP and Camp Canaan Land, and that's a, a wonderful camp. Tim Rader is the pastor of, Fellow of Fundamental Baptist Church, and uh, he is my friend and uh, has been at Fundamental from the beginning, planted that church in the UP. God has blessed it. It has grown. They run about 500 people in the UP, which is about 10 people shy of everyone. And... Um, Sometimes he said, literally, he doesn't cancel church when they get 12, 15, 20 inches of snow, and they literally come in on their snow machines to church. I mean, that's, that, that's either crazy or commitment. I don't know which, uh, but uh, they, uh, it's a wonderful thing, and God has uh, led him to start that camp, and God is blessing it, and uh, we're so thankful for the opportunity to support him and support what God is doing there, and uh, looking forward to, I think last time I knew there was 26 junior campers going, and I think that's a wonderful number, so be praying for them as they head out uh, tomorrow. All right, I think, uh, I don't know that I see any necessary first-time visitors, but if you're here visiting with us, please make sure you see me, and uh, we'll be glad uh, to give you a packet of information, and thank you for being here. We're glad, but uh, our folks here tonight, looking forward to a wonderful time around God's Word. An opportunity to catch up with the Rayfelds. I'll say a little bit more about them. Most of you know them and have prayed for them and are glad to see them. Some of you maybe do not know the whole story, but Archie and Ruth Perez are sent out of our church. And so we are the sending church for the Perezes, and uh, they're down in Uruguay in South America. And uh, God has really built a great relationship between our church and the ministry down there. We've been able to help in a number of things. And um, I have a great relationship with Archie. Uh, Brother Jonathan came along with his wife, Mickey, and, um, and our hearts knit with theirs. And uh, uh, Pat, uh, Pastor Archie asked me to uh, talk with Jonathan to see is there a potential fit for him. Uh, after talking with him, I couldn't say enough good things uh, about the Rayfelds and what I felt they would be able to do uh, in Uruguay as teammates with the Perezes, and that is the truth. It has been certainly a thing that God has blessed, and they have a beautiful relationship. And so our hearts have just been knit further uh, to the Rayfelds and uh, all that God is doing in Uruguay. So uh, I know you're in for a real treat tonight. Uh, Jonathan is a gifted speaker and uh, taught Greek at, uh, at Maranatha before meeting uh, Mickey and then going to the mission field. So you notice this morning while I was sitting, I didn't make any reference to Greek. Uh, 
I'm just kidding. It's all good. I am so thankful for his gifting. God utilizes that as he oversees the seminary there in Uruguay and does a lot of translating from uh, material into Spanish and all kinds of things. And so we're in for a treat tonight. And as we get more and more exposed uh, to what God is doing in our missions program, as well as we're going to be able to, in our business meeting tonight, uh, give away some more missions money. Amen? And uh, God just continues to uh, bring us money that he wants us to give to specific things. And like I told you, we'll keep casting it out on the water. And as it comes in, we'll cast it out again. And this is a whole lot of fun. I'm enjoying it. And so as we're faithful to the Lord, uh, we, are demonst- we are seeing how he blesses that faithfulness. And we want to continue that. All right. So let's begin with a word of prayer and then we'll sing. All right. Lord, thank you for the time tonight. Thank you for the opportunity that you give to us to worship you, to be able to uh, greet one another, to love on one another, to encourage one another, to bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Lord, we are thankful that you give us the chance to worship you together, to learn together, to grow in our understanding of who you are and what you're like and how we can be conformed to your image. We thank you for the privilege of participating with missions all over the world, and we're thankful for teammates like the Rayfelds. I pray for your blessings upon their uh, furlough, that they would rest, that they would uh, be encouraged through their reporting back to their supporting churches. I pray that the time with family would be absolutely sweet and refreshing. I pray that you would bless them continually. I ask you, Heavenly Father, to use them tonight uh, to update us, but to encourage us with the work that is being done as well as through the word of God, we thank you, Heavenly Father, for the privilege that you've given to us to be a blessing to them. So I pray that you'd help us to do that. And we do pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing a, a number of songs this evening. And uh, we'll start with 364, I Will Sing of My Redeemer. And we'll just do the first verse, and then we'll go on to the next song, sing the first verse, and to the next song and sing the first verse again. But let's all stand and sing. 364, I Will Sing of My Redeemer. I will sing of my Redeemer and His wondrous love to me. On the cruel cross he suffered, from the curse to set me free. Sing, oh sing, of my Redeemer, with his blood he purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt and made me free. Look and live, I've a message from the Lord. I've a message from the Lord, hallelujah. The message unto you I give. Tis recorded in his word, hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. Look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. Tis recorded in his word, hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. There's room at the cross, the cross upon which Jesus died is a shelter in which we can hide. And his grace so free is sufficient for me. And deep is its fountain, as wide as the sea. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. If you're tired of the load of your sin, if you are tired of the load of your sin, 
the Jesus come into your heart. If you desire a new life to begin, let Jesus come into your heart. Just now your doubtings give o'er, just now reject him no more, just now throw open the door, let Jesus come in. Go ahead and be seated and turn over to 345, a song that I we have every once in a while have done, but uh, one that we don't know well. So I thought we'd take some time tonight and learn the chorus and learn the verse, and, and uh, we'll work it into our services a little bit more. Uh, the song is, No Other Name is Given, No Other Way is Known, Jesus Christ, the First and Last, He Saves and he alone. It's a great chorus. It's a great song there. Let's go ahead and start right there on the chorus, No Other Name. If you don't know it well, don't sing it out too loud. Listen a bit louder than you're singing. Ready? No other name is given. No other way is known. Jesus Christ, the first and last, he saves and he alone. Let's try that one more time on that chorus. Ready? No other name is given. No other way is known. Jesus Christ, the first and last, he saves and he alone. That first verse says, One offer of salvation to all the world make known. The only sure foundation is Christ, the cornerstone. And then the chorus there. Again, great words uh, written by Philip Bliss and uh, written by a guy I went to college with, James Quartz, as far as the music goes there. So let's try uh, singing that verse. One offer of salvation. We'll end with that chorus and then we'll turn things over to Pastor. One offer of salvation to all the world make known. The only sure foundation is Christ, the cornerstone. No other name is given, no other way is known. Jesus Christ, the first and last, he saves and he alone. Again, a good message for us to commit to our hearts and to our minds and that we can sing more uh, frequently as we learn as we go. Pastor. Amen. What a tremendous song with a tremendous truth. One of those tunes that would probably be healthy for us to catch in our minds and hum and sing those words and remind us of the great salvation that is provided in Christ and the responsibility that is ours to share what we possess. What an incredible challenge. What a great verse to remind us what we are and have in Christ. An opportunity tonight to be able to give in the offering, opportunity to worship the Lord as we give, sing praises to him in our heart as we uh, reminisce in our own minds about God's goodness and how much he has blessed us and the privilege that is ours to be able to give. Eric, would you pray? Ask God's blessing, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We pray tonight, Lord, that you be glorified in all that we say and do. We thank you, Lord, that you are our chief cornerstone. You're the first and the last, last and only uh, through Jesus Christ are we saved. We thank you, Lord, for every tithe, gift, and offering. We we give back to you, Lord, what you have given to us, and we ask you to give wisdom to us in its dispersion, dispersion, and we pray, Lord, that it would feed spiritually and physically thousands around the world, Lord. We pray for our missionaries, Lord, to use it wisely, and we pray, Lord, that uh, you be glorified in all that we do in Jesus' name. Amen.
amazing grace, how sweet the song that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Amazing grace, amazing grace, so vast and yet so free. The Son of God, the Righteous One, is crucified for me. T'was grace that taught grace that my, heart my heart to fear, fear. and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear. The hour I first believed, amazing grace, amazing grace, so vast and yet so free, the Son of God, the Righteous One, is crucified for me. Many dangers, toils, and snares I have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me Shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Amazing grace, amazing grace, so vast and yet so free. The Son of God, the righteous one. Thank you, Wygos. I heard the look, I, I mean, I heard, I saw the look of horror on some of your faces when they were coming up and I was standing, and you thought I was going to join them, didn't you? <laughs> Scared all of you to death. But uh, what, a, what a wonderful, what a beautiful song, beautifully sang and played. It was beautiful. I thank the Lord for it. Well, I am so thankful for what God is doing at Faith Baptist Church in a lot of facets, but specifically as God has allowed us to make a difference in worldwide missions through uh, the generous and obedient giving of you, God is working around the world. And we're thankful uh, to have teammates in Uruguay like the Perez's, like the Rayfelds. And I'm so thankful for Jonathan and Mickey. They're a great team, and I thank the Lord for what they're doing. Their son uh, is growing like a weed. And uh, when we were in Uruguay just a few short years ago, he was itty bitty. And uh, they fed him and he grew up. And uh, so I hope you get a chance to interact with him. Jonathan, why don't you come? And uh, we're, we're actually going to start a four minute video and then he's going to come and take the rest of the service. The origins of the Church of Jesus Christ are supernatural. His life, death, and resurrection are a mystery that, when heard and believed, result in godliness or Holy Spirit indwelling. The Church began as a small band of persecuted disciples within Judaism in the first century, but quickly grew and spread past Jerusalem. Within 50 years, much of Mediterranean Europe had heard the Gospel. Within 300, Christianity was officially incorporated into the most powerful empire of the ancient world. Yet its essence was never contained by or best expressed through politics. 
Like a mysterious wind, it blew through the Roman Empire, saving the lives of those who believed it. It continued through the Reformation, breathing new life into those who rediscovered it. And today, despite secular and naturalistic forces to the contrary, people are being born of the Spirit. Mickey and I met because of our mutual desire to serve God in South America. I was a focus missionary on deputation and a Greek professor at Maranatha Baptist University. And she was a young and available marketing major with a Spanish minor. In the fall of 2012, our pastor suggested that we get to know each other. So we went out for coffee, and let's just say that it was really good coffee. We made clear during our wedding that we wanted our union to further the cause of the gospel and not to hinder it. We finished deputation together. And shortly after arriving in Uruguay, God blessed us with Owen. Upon arriving in Uruguay, almost everything we knew in theory about the country materialized in experience. Uruguay was founded as a buffer state between Argentina and Brazil, and therefore is neutral by default. The culture bears the marks of this independent cowboy past, and the people are friendly, but resistant to change. Everyone describes the unhurried spirit here with one word, tranquilo a shallow historic Catholicism coupled with secular faith and the dazzling promises made by technology has resulted in one of the most nihilistic cultures on planet Earth. We often encourage ourselves with Romans 5.20, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. We are based in the city of Colonia, and we have the wonderful advantage of working with a team. Pastor Archie Perez leads the congregation of El General, Pastor Gabriel Chauvier leads the mission work in El Real. Not long ago, a church plant in Nueva Alvesia became independent, and another work just began in Nueva Palmira. I oversee the seminary which meets in the building of El Real. And we thank God and you, our supporters, for your generous giving which has made this meeting place possible. Our goal in the seminary is to sow, cultivate, and defend the good seed of the Word of God. We do this through intensive teaching, evangelistic conferences and mission trips, and involving each student in local church activities like preaching. In 2018, we published a book in Biblical Greek, which is now being used in at least five countries. There is much to do in Uruguay, and we are seeing God use our church, our seminary, and our camps to fulfill Christ's purpose to build His church. We look forward to the day when the church and seminary of El Royal can meet in a finished building. We would love to see our YouTube and publication ministry prosper and be a source of sustainable income for some of our faithful co-workers. Of course, the most pressing need is for more pastors and servant leaders to be led of God to start new works throughout Uruguay. God is able, and thank you for your prayers. Good evening, everyone. Well, we've been blessed to spend the last four and a half years of our lives with the Perez's. Uh, they have been wonderful mentors to us, and the church here is obviously very familiar with them because you're their sending church. And um, there's a rich legacy that the church has, uh, not only here in Michigan, but also in Uruguay. Uh, the Perez's have been there now for 20 years, and the Lord has really used them to impact really the whole country uh, for the cause of Christ. And... Um, we, there in the ministry, we meet almost every week, and we have a leadership meeting, uh, besides the other normal meetings that we have. And uh, I don't know how many times Brother Archie has referenced the church here, and specifically Dr. Cummins. Of course, uh, Dr. Cummins, a pastor, I don't know how many years ago, uh, but uh, boy, he was, he was a great influence in Pastor Archie's life. And uh, he often, one thing he says over and over and over again uh, is that everything rises and falls on leadership. And maybe Dr. Cummins said that all the time, but I tell you, that has really impacted Brother Archie and that he takes leadership training very seriously. That was our heart when we arrived to Uruguay, and uh, the presidents have just been wonderful mentors to us. Of course, we know how it is working with the team. Um, all of us are different, and when there can be differences, not huge differences, but when there can be differences of gifts and sometimes even of preference, 
uh, but you can work together in harmony among the leadership team that makes the ministry stronger. And it also provides a good example for uh, the church membership. What do I, how do I work together when maybe there's some differences in our preferences? Well, it can be done as we submit to the Holy Spirit. And uh, we, are, we are just so thrilled to be able to work with the Perez's. Thank you for their, your investment in their lives, for sending them to Uruguay, sustaining them there in Uruguay. And uh, we couldn't hope to have better co-workers than we have in the Perez's. Uh, so we want to thank you for that, and thank you for your involvement, too, in the projects recently. Uh, not only do you support the prizes financially, and you pray for them, you support us as well, uh, but in, we've, uh, as we needed a building for the seminary and for the church in El Real, we thought, well, our, our people won't have the money for something like this, but there certainly is, seems to be a need here. And uh, we mentioned to our churches the need, and the churches really responded. And you've participated in that in a very significant way. And uh, then as we moved into the seminary property there in El Real, uh, where we have our camps and we meet for our seminary and institute where the church plant now is meeting, uh, we're using that building. We've been praying about using it for a school maybe within the next year or two. And that would be a, a huge ministry to our church and eventually maybe even to the city. But uh, you're, you've made an impact and we want to thank you for that. And uh, what I want to do tonight is go through quickly a PowerPoint uh, is the exact thing that I presented when we were here perhaps uh, five and a half to six years ago. And we said, this is our plan for ministry when we arrive in Uruguay. And all I want to do tonight is follow up on that. Here's what we said we would do. How did it go? And uh, I want to make ourselves accountable. So uh, we had a church planting strategy. But before we get into that, let's just review. Uh, most of you probably know where Uruguay is, but just in case you're not quite clear, um, on the PowerPoint there, if you scroll over it, you should see a little play button, and then you can zoom in. Usually it works, sometimes it doesn't work. If you scroll over, and then you hit a play button, we should be able to zoom in there. There we go. Let's go back, and then the play button right there. So we'll zoom into Uruguay. Of course, we're in South America, southern South America. And uh, we're going to zoom into Colonia. We are just across the Rio de la Plata which is the Silver River from Buenos Aires. You can see Buenos Aires over there on the left. That's one of the biggest cities in South America. And here we're zooming right into Colonia del Sacramento, where we are located. And uh, I'll just give you a quick rundown here. <clears throat> the mother church where Brother Archie is the, the lead pastor is right here in El General. Mickey and I live just five blocks away from the church or so. And the new building is over here. Real estate is not cheap over there. And the fact that we could get a nice... Now, the building needs a lot of work, but the property itself is beautiful. And the building is becoming more and more beautiful every day. Uh, but uh, we are located over here. And down here would be the historic quarters. We get a lot of tourists over here from Buenos Aires, from Argentina, that come over here. And it's a beautiful area just to tour and walk. And Mickey and I, sometimes we walk down there and we have to pinch ourselves. We say, you know, we didn't come to Colony because it's so beautiful, but it sure doesn't hurt that it's beautiful down here. Uh, El General is, is not so beautiful. That's where we live. Uh, but it's kind of nice to escape every once in a while and go down to the tourist quarters there in downtown. So uh, we knew that once we arrived, we needed to have some kind of plan in place in these five areas. Evangelism, conversion, congregation, instruction and discipleship, and then plan for reproducing churches. Now, we had a great advantage. A lot of missionaries, when they go to the, the, the foreign mission field, uh, they are kind of going it alone. Uh, and uh, sometimes, for a variety of reasons, teams don't work out. But that's why I want to show uh, this picture here. Uh, we have been blessed with a wonderful leadership team. Different gifts uh, and sometimes different approaches or methods that we might use to minister, but Brother Archie is very good at delegating and uh, helping us just lead us and let us be responsible in our area. Uh, but a very good leader at the same time and good supervisor, a good bishop, if you will, overseer of the work there. Uh, so we just, we love them so much. Mickey calls Ruth her Uruguayan mom, uh, and they have a great relationship, and we're so thankful for that. Uh, Pastor Gabriel Chauvier has been uh, trained in the ministry, uh, you know, starting 15, 16 years ago, and now he's pastoring in the new building that we were able to purchase about two and a half years ago. His wife is Rebecca. This is Pastor Gustavo and his wife, Irene. And he, he's, uh, he does, he's kind of the jack of all trades. He lives on the property there. The property was a blessing for lots of reasons, but there's also two houses there. And uh, they had a very small apartment, no yard. And this has been just a, a wonderful place for them to spread their wings a little bit. And he really takes good care of the property. There in Uruguay, you need someone to be on the property to help protect it. And also so that the people don't come and 
uh, try to claim the property themselves. It sounds kind of crazy, but someone needs to be there all the time, and that works out perfectly for their family. Uh, this is Pablo and Cristina. He's a deacon, and she's the secretary of the church. David is gifted all around. Uh, he's very musical, and he's also helping us make some new evangelistic videos that I'll show you in just a minute. We're making tracks that also have a YouTube corresponding video. Uh, so we're giving the gospel in that context. And we've got some exciting plans underway uh, to, to really, I think, grow that ministry. So he, he's a blessing in many ways. He, he married Andrea Perez, the Perez's daughter. And uh, this, is, this is Alejandra. She's leading our Sunday school, directing our Sunday school. She's married to Pablo, who is not saved yet. But we are continuing to work on Pablo, and we're really praying he comes to know the Lord soon. Uh, and then this is Eber. He was a Waldensian, believe it or not. Uh, I know Dr. Cummins was just, when he came years ago, he was thrilled to know that there's still Waldensian churches in existence. There sure are down there in Uruguay. Not many other places in the world, but in Uruguay there are some. They've become more ecumenical and liberal in the last 20 years. And that's why Eber and Norma uh, came to our church, and they've been faithful. He's a faithful deacon in the church there. This is our leadership team. So for evangelism, I'm going to go through this kind of quick. I hope you won't mind. Uh, this is what we said when we were here around 2012, 2013. We said, we know we need to immerse ourselves in the community, maybe do a family story night, uh, family evangelism, always try to focus on the father because if the, the male figure in the home can be reached, often the whole family will follow suit. Uh, inductive Bible studies and English tutoring. So what happened? Well, we have met almost all of our neighbors uh, and had gospel conversations with many of them. We've invited all of them to special evangelistic meetings. Uh, Uruguay is generally considered a closed country. And so we went there knowing that, in fact, Brother Archie, when we were visiting him in uh, 2000, maybe <clears throat> 13 or 14, he said, now, we want you guys to know what you're getting into if you come here. He said, we have, we have knocked on doors in our city multiple times and seen very little fruit. He said, when you come, you need to know this is an atheistic country. And we knew that, and, but we also wanted to go to more of an unreached country, and we wanted to be challenged that way. Uh, but, so we have been working with our neighbors and on our neighbors. We've had some of our neighbors in our homes. We've been in the homes of many of them, sharing the gospel. And uh, we have yet to see one of our neighbors, at least as far as we know, make a decision to trust Christ. But we're not going to give up. We're going to keep working on them. And uh, this is, we're trying to just be faithful in our, in our Coviempa, it's called. It's a cooperative where all of the houses are kind of connected. There's 28 units, and uh, that's kind of our little mission field, our neighborhood. Our church has hosted three neighborhood Bible clubs, uh, and uh, I am working on establishing friendships with a number of fathers. Um, recently, I've been able to get to know a, year, a general in the Uruguayan army. His wife was coming to church, and uh, she started coming, and then he decided to visit maybe a year after she had started coming. And I was trying to befriend him and get to know him. He came to a men's meeting, and he received Christ in the men's Amen. meeting. And he's been coming ever since, uh, and we're just praying for his growth now. Our church has begun using the Fundamentals Bible Study. And uh, our seminary has helped two new works, one in Rocha, which is on the eastern side of Uruguay, another in Nueva Palmira, which is a new church plant about an hour and 45 minutes north of us. And uh, what we do is we take some of our men from the seminary and we're teaching them missions in their own country. I say, guys, if you're, you know, as we answer the missionary call, don't look any further than your own backyards because Uruguay is considered the most unreached country in South America. And it's also the most atheistic. And so there's needs here, guys, and we uh, do mission trips in their own country so they can start to get a vision for their own country. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Bible time in the plaza. It's only a couple blocks behind where we're living in El General. Uh, as we've been renovating the new property that we bought, uh, we had to replace the roof. That was one of the first steps. And uh, the man in the background is Juan. He is pastoring the new church plant in Nueva Palmira. He sent out of our church. And then Bruno is uh, one of the young guys who came to seminary this last year. By the way, we do full-time seminary in the Uruguayan summer, which is December, January, and February. That's really what works best for most people's schedule. And so we meet summer. It's intensive. These guys have given their summers up to study the Word of God instead of you know, waste their time and play video games. They are, they're studying the Word of God, and we're pushing them. Uh, and Bruno was helping with the roof, and they got talking, and, and Bruno decided to go up the whole year with Juan to help him plant this church. Uh, and so we're excited that we're seeing God already use the men in our seminary to do missions. And uh, there's a little boy here, Jeronimo. 
It was during the children's camp. He was listening so intently one day, and he understood the gospel. He received Christ. He was coming, always excited to come to church, and uh, he stopped coming. And we took him a children's Bible. We saw him walking in the street, and I said, Hey, Jeronimo, where have you been? And he said, No, my, my dad says I have to play soccer on Sundays. I can't come to church. And that's illustrative of a huge problem in Uruguay. People love soccer, but people don't often have an understanding for spiritual things, no, no, no desire, no appetite. So I have a, a goal, the second term, I, I need to work harder at getting to know Geronimo's dad and winning him to Christ. And that is a goal that I have. And you can be praying for him. I'm not sure of his name. I've met him and he works at a meat market. Uh, but I know that his dad right now is being an obstacle in his life and then in his whole family as well. Uh, so we'll, we'll work on his dad and pray for his dad. Uh, this is a picture of when we went to Rocha on the eastern coast with uh, most of these guys are seminary guys. Pastor Gustavo came, a couple other teens came, and um, we were evangelizing that week. And then that Sunday, there were, they broke their attendance record. That little building was packed with people, and uh, the Lord used our seminary to give the church a lot of contacts. And so uh, just teaching our, our men missionary life uh, in their own country. So that's uh, some things that have happened, notable things as far as evangelism goes. For conversion, we said we need to preach for changed lives, cultivate an atmosphere of fellowship in church so people are comfortable discussing spiritual things, and then we knew that detailed and aggressive follow-up would be very important. And so what happened? By the grace of God, at least 16 people have made professions of faith through our preaching and through our teaching, but only about half attend church regular, maybe a little better than half. And I think that's a struggle anywhere you go. Uh, what's God's plan for discipleship after someone has received Christ as their Savior? They need to be in church so they can hear the Word of God, grow, have godly friendships. Uh, that's, that's important for all of us. Uh, if we haven't, maybe you're not a member of a local church, that is God's will for your life so you can grow God's way. Uh, but even so, we know sometimes it's hard. People have a hard time changing their lifestyles. Uh, that is important. That's maybe not the only test of our faith, if it's a true faith, but it's, it is hard sometimes. And so I'm just being very transparent of kind of what we've seen as we've worked with people. We continue, we, we continue to encourage people to come and grow God's way, but sometimes it is a struggle. And uh, we are usually the last ones to leave church, seeking to build friendships. Uh, Andres and Anai came to our creation conference a couple years ago. They came up from a Pentecostal background, and we followed up with them. We said, hey, uh, look, where are, you guys are, where, where are you guys from? And tell us your story. We spent three hours in their house talking about speaking in tongues, whether or not you can lose your salvation, as is taught in the Pentecostal church. And uh, I said, you know, you, you need to get to know us a little better. Because they said they loved the conference, they, they were blessed. So I said, you guys need to come back to uh, our, our Christmas program. They came back, and they've been coming ever since. This was two and a half years ago. They're, they're there almost every Sunday. And uh, they're not members yet. They're still working through a couple of those issues. Uh, but they have been growing, and it's been exciting to see how God is blessed simply following up with people. Uh, now they have, uh, Andres, he has a sister named Laura, and she started coming after her brother started coming. They own a pizza shop, and they have since become members of our church. Amen. And uh, they, they often will make pizza for special events, so that's been a blessing. And uh, we prayerfully depend upon God for every message and lesson so that lives might be changed. Congregation, we said, the goal is to preach expositionally and cycle through the Bible's most important themes, focus on reaching others with regular evangelistic messages, and be indigenous. This is a quote I picked up from uh, one of the books I was reading as we were getting ready for um, missions. It said, local people free from outside control and imported designs can, under the Spirit's direction, become the natural contextualizing community. And that basically means, especially if you're an American, where we do have a certain way of doing things, and we are very developed, if not the most developed culture in the world, uh, we want to be careful we don't go make people American because there are some things here that aren't necessarily Bible. They're just our preference and our way of doing things. It's our culture. Uh, and sometimes it's hard to sift through that. We don't want to make, force people into becoming Americans. They can't be. They don't have nearly the resources we do to match our lifestyle. Uh, and so that's something we were aware of. And really, God has used the leadership team that we have to help us learn the ropes of ministry in a different culture. It's been a great safety net, if you will, for Mickey and I. And we also knew, I bolded this years ago, we knew that our main task would be to aid the Bible Institute there, which is, as Brother Archie said, the church, I want it to be the motor of the church planting program, and I want the seminary to be the wheels of the church planting program. Uh, and also, I, I, I always wanted to teach biblical Greek. And so what happened? Well, 
Uh, I've sought to model expositional preaching, and I teach the young men to do the same. In our classes, we have preaching classes, and these guys, like you saw in the video, we say, guys, you're in the seminary. Even if you're 14 or 15, you're going to be preaching. And it uh, makes them nervous, but it's great training. And we know God won't maybe call all of these men to be pastors, but we trust and are praying that he'll call some of them to be pastors. And this is all part of the, the confirmation process for them and for us to see who really is equipped uh, to be a pastor or to serve in that ministry. Our new seminary curricul curriculum contains all of the classic courses sprinkled with some book studies, contemporary and practical theology. We also have thrown in a few practical classes like diet and nutrition. We've included some technology classes uh, so people can be aware not only of the proper use of technology, but what are some th helpful things you can do with technology. And um, by next furlough, we hope to have all classes finalized and or updated. Uh, I spend a lot of my time writing and working on the class materials, and then this next uh, four or four and a half years will probably be much of the same, but I estimate that we'll probably have these 50 plus courses in really good shape by the end of our second furlough. I think there was one more thing there. And we also got to publish our first book on biblical Greek. So uh, let's just show you a few pictures here. These are pic a few pictures of some of our students that have studied in the last year. Uh, their WhatsApp profiles, I just I grabbed them off of their WhatsApp accounts. And uh, this is a picture, we took this picture in March of this year. Uh, it was, we were just celebrating the men who participated. Some of them are finishing their first year of our seminary and some of them are finishing their second year. Uh, if you say, well, seminary, isn't that for like, you know, guys who are 25 plus? In the States, generally, yes. Uh, but, you know, it's a different culture and a different way of doing things down there. Uh, we do very much the same kind of thing. Our, our goal in the seminary, is, our logo as well, is, uh, and I'll have to translate it, it's uh, cultivating, um, it's planting, cultivating, and defending the good seed of the word of God. And so, uh, can you do that when you're 15? Yes, you can. Can you do that when you're 24? Yes, you can. Uh, and that's what we're doing in the seminary. We're training men really of all ages to do this. Uh, and some of these guys then are, are, are finishing their second year of seminary as well. Mickey is gifted in a lot of different areas. She was a marketing major at Maranatha, and she loves to cook. So that's been something she's uh, been able to use in lots of different ministries. Uh, she helped with the design of our, our seminary logo there, as well as these new tracks that we've developed. I, I said I would, I would talk a little bit more about these. That's the evolution tract. We passed out one of those to every, almost every house in the city as we prepared for our creation conference. Um, I wrote the tracks. Mickey helped with the design of the tracks. And now we're creating videos that correspond to the tracks and redesigning the tracks a little bit like this one. You probably can't see it from where you're seated. seated. But it's, uh, it says, where is technology taking us? Have you ever wondered that? Uh, where's all this going to end? I mean, 100 years ago, the world looked very different. We've got, we've got electricity pumping the, the, the light into our building. There's so many different changes. The iPhone, you know, the smartphone, it's huge changes. And uh, if you ever wonder, where is this taking us? We talk a little bit about that in the tract, and we use that to share the gospel. And then right on the tract, it says, these are the search terms for the YouTube. You want to watch a cool video about this topic? Check out this, this video. And David is very gifted with this, this video production. And uh, this is a ministry we're working on. I'm trying to use a lot of our furlough time to uh, create some new tracks and new videos. Uh, and it's uh, something that Mickey can help with because she kind of has an eye for that design. Uh, so it's just a neat ministry we've been involved in and we're working, working on now. Uh, so I mentioned the Greek book. I, I started experimenting. When, when we arrived, I, of course, we were studying Spanish grammar and I was uh, you know, taking some notes and doing some uh, explanations for Greek grammar as well. And I uh, started writing a curriculum. Within a year or two, had a curriculum ready. I said, I'm going to start making just summaries of this curriculum, throw it up on YouTube and see who watches it. And so by the second year, uh, fourth quarter, we, we really got, saw some pretty marked growth. And people in every Spanish-speaking country in the world had by this time accessed our videos, and they were watching them. And uh, so right at, during this quarter, I met a man. Of course, I hadn't planned this, but the Lord had planned this. Uh, I met a man named Russell Raymer who makes uh, theological instructional videos for basically the whole Spanish-speaking world. And uh, he, we met at a conference in Buenos Aires, and he said, I've been looking for a long time for someone who could teach biblical Greek and Spanish. And uh, he knew I had taught for Maranatha, and he said, I wonder if, if you'd be interested. And I said, I would definitely be interested. And so in June of 2018, we met in Rockford, Illinois, and uh, we met for a week, uh, taping most of the day. 
we got these classes done, and this was a perfect time to compile all of the notes together and make a book, which we're now selling on, on Amazon.com. And uh, it's a, basically, it's an introduction to biblical Greek. By the end of, if you work through this book, uh, you'll be able to have a, a decent facility or ability to translate uh, the New Testament, or at least parts of the New Testament, from its original language, which is Greek. And so we're excited about this book. We don't know how, how far this book might go. We've sold, I think, a little better than 60 copies so far. And we put it up on Amazon uh, August 1st of last year. Well, I figure as the class circulates, that'll probably help the book circulate as well. And any money that comes in from this book, we are putting it right back into the seminary because Mickey and I are very well supported by our generous supporters and we really need nothing more. And so we're, we're putting that back into the seminary. And here's another look at the book. It says, uh, natural, careful, simplified, and easy to read. And so uh, this, let's see, we're, we're almost done here. We said we need to keep a weekly visitation schedule, teach godly male leadership in a machismo culture, uh, combat false doctrines common in Uruguay through relevant scripture and curriculum, and encourage reading because readers are leaders. And I have to admit, I have not been reading a lot recently. It's been a lot of writing and things. Uh, but Pastor Loggins, who is our sending church, uh, from our sending church, he's always encouraging this, and I think he's right, and we're encouraging our men the same. You know, you don't have to be prolific readers, but it'll help you if you just become something of a reader. Of course, we need to be in the scriptures, but it's also helpful to be reading other sources, other, other books for encouragement and for, for learning. So uh, we do keep a weekly visitation schedule. We hosted two special conferences, one on creation, another one on technology this year, and um, probably need to do a biblical gender conference. Uh, we we kind of know what's going on with that. People are today are because they've rejected the Creator God, the God of the Bible. They're very confused about what nature makes very simple for us that there are two genders. Uh, and so in Uruguay, it's also just very confused right now. And uh, I think it'd be a good time, maybe within the next year or two, we'll do a biblical gender conference and even do a tract about that and I pray that God uses it. And all seminarians are required to read and write skills that are lost to many information agers because they're always doing stuff on their phones. Uh, their annual binder serves as a handy theological reference. So they come, we expect a lot of them, but we also teach them how to do the work. We get them reading and then they can save all their materials in a, in a binder that they can have uh, for their future ministries. Here's a picture of our creation conference. Uh, we did that a, a couple or a few years ago. This is an invitation that we handed out with this tract. Again, to almost every house, if not every house in Colonia. Sometimes we miss a few, but we try to reach every, uh, every house in our city because that is kind of a, a special thing the church can do as an evangelistic outreach with a special theme as well. Uh, so let's see here. And then uh, this is just a slide about what you all are probably already familiar with. Brother Archie is, provides as a pastor a model situation and then from the, the mother church, they seek to send out other, other uh, pastors from that church and help them become independent. Uh, there's different ways of doing missions. Sometimes it depends on where you are in the world. But this is a model that we've seen God use. And uh, it's one that we're, we're just uh, happy to be involved with there in Colonia. So I wonder, I, that was a really fast presentation, but uh, I think we have a couple of minutes uh, before the, the brief message if, if anyone has questions for us. Yes. Everyone speaks Spanish. And uh, a few people speak English, but that's rare. Anybody else? It's okay if not. All right. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 18 tonight. And I bet I know what some of you are thinking already. You might be thinking, uh, Matthew 18 is not a light chapter. Or you might be thinking, oh, wait, in Matthew 18, doesn't that talk about church discipline? And, uh, well, yes and yes. Yes and yes. And the reason that I thought it would be appropriate is because the Lord has been teaching Mickey and I the importance of uh, working so that the church can be not only stable, but long-lasting and healthy. And this is something we've been learning, especially in our time in Uruguay. Uh, you know, we praise the Lord, like I said, for the Prezes who have been wonderful mentors to us. 
But, you know, we praise the Lord that Brother Archie takes church discipline seriously. It's not easy at all. But he takes it seriously because he loves the Lord and the holiness, personal holiness, and the holiness of the church is important to our Lord. And um, as leaders, we're responsible in the overseeing of that. A personal holiness is hard enough, but as we seek the Lord and love the Lord and pursue him, you know, the leaders are responsible to emphasize the things that Jesus Christ emphasizes. And um, I want to set the stage a little bit for Matthew chapter 18, because um, we first see this come up in in Matthew chapter 16. Let me just take you there for a minute. You don't have to turn there. Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they said, well, some think that you're Elijah. Others say you're John the Baptist raised from the dead. Some say that you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And Jesus said, but who do you think that I am? And Peter said, I believe that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are your eyes, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I, I tell you that you are Peter. Peter means rock. So we can imagine Simon thinking, oh, wow. Jesus is saying, I'm a rock. He says, you are Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I will give to you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you loose upon the earth will be loosed in heaven, and whatever you bind upon the earth will be bound in heaven. So he mentions this term, or this phrase, that is really often confused. The keys to the kingdom of heaven. Then he gives us the definition. What does that mean? Now, the keys to the kingdom of heaven does not refer to maybe what the Pope can do when uh, he makes some decision for the church, as if it's binding. There's no position. Jesus Christ is that to the church, but the Pope certainly isn't. That's an invention of history. Someone says, well, Peter was the first Pope, and then after that, his successors, they, they kept that theology alive. Well, Peter himself didn't think that he was the only rock that Christ would use to build his church. Now, Jesus did say he's the cornerstone. Then you have the apostles and prophets who wrote the scriptures, which are binding for every believer, But then after that, Peter said, as he was writing in 1 Peter chapter 2, he said, all of you are living stones. Stones. That wasn't that a great privilege to be called Peter. Now Peter is saying, all of you are living stones, and you are being built together, a a spiritual uh, household to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. He says, I'm not the only stone here. You all have a special privilege because Christ has invited you to become part of his church. And you're trusting in his righteousness and not your own, and you're saved. And so uh, carrying the keys to the kingdom of heaven begins right there by recognizing who Jesus is. There is no other way to the Father. There is no other way to be saved. There is no other way to receive eternal life. Jesus is the only way. And he is the unique son of God that Peter recognized er earlier on in Jesus' ministry. And uh, now if we're in Matthew chapter 18... You notice that in verse 18, the same definition comes up for what it means to carry the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Let's look at verse 18. He says, Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Does that sound familiar? That's exactly what he said in Matthew chapter 16, after he said, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you loose will be loosed. Whatever you bind will be bound. He's saying the exact same thing here in chapter 18. Only in chapter 18, he gives us a much broader definition of how this looks, how you actually carry this out in the church. And so what we're going to do with our time is quickly go through Matthew chapter 18 to answer this question. What does it mean to carry the keys to the kingdom of heaven? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your gracious work in our lives. This morning we focus this on the grace of God which has saved us. We thank you for that grace. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men in the person of Jesus Christ. We love him. We're thankful for him. We're trusting in him. And we pray for his soon return. But while we're waiting for him, I pray that tonight you'll use this passage to help us carry the keys responsibly and faithfully and that you use this passage to bless your church in a special, powerful, deep, and lasting way. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. And so in 18, he gives the definition again. What does it mean to carry the keys to the kingdom of heaven? Well, first of all, we have to have the same confession that Peter had. Who is Jesus? He's more than a good man. 
He's more than a revolutionary, like our neighbor behind us often tells me. Jesus was a revolutionary, an amazing man, a prophet, but he was not the Son of God. That's the way our neighbor talks to us. The Bible says, don't cast your pearl before swine. Now, we've worked with him and worked with him and worked with him. And he, like many other liberals of our day, say, Jesus couldn't be who he claimed to be. But that's the only way to salvation. You have to understand and receive who Jesus really was. He was the unique son of God, born of a virgin, lived a miraculous and perfect life. He died as a perfect redemption and sacrifice for our sins, and he rose again the third day. And he's coming again to reign in righteousness on this earth. This is the gospel. This is the Jesus of the Bible. And if you reject him, you are rejecting life. If you receive him, you are receiving life from God Almighty. And also the opportunity to live a productive and abundant spiritual life, carrying the keys to the kingdom of heaven. There's been times when I've forgotten my keys to the car, or maybe you struggle with misplacing your keys. I do too. But misplacing the keys or not using the keys to the kingdom of heaven really is a big deal. And so it starts by recognizing who Jesus is. Let's read verses 3 through 5, or 3 through 4 of chapter 18 here. It says, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So where does this, uh, this ability, this, this privilege, this responsibility begin? Recognizing who Jesus is, but also humbling ourselves like a child before the Father. If we are trusting in our background to do something great with our life, if we're trusting in our experience, our knowledge, our, 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 our abilities, it's not going to be enough. Just as we're teaching our little boy, Owen, certain very basic things that he just sometimes doesn't get, he needs to be instructed. God says every last person needs to humble themselves like a child before the Father before they can really do something for God. Um, and so it begins by recognizing who Jesus is, and then we humble ourselves and become like children. Now, if you look at verse 5, it says, Who shall receive one such child in my name receiveth me? It's easy to think now, oh, he's just talking about children. He's transitioned from humbling yourself and now he's talking about children. Well, in a sense, yes. But he is saying he's using this childlike analogy to talk about how he views believers. If you're 85 and you've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you've humbled yourself before, before Christ that way, you're one of these little ones. And if there's a 10-year-old who's humbled himself and understood the gospel message and believed it, then he's one of these little ones. And so now there's a transition in verse 5, and the rest of the passage has to do with one of these little ones, we who have tr trusted in Jesus Christ. Now let's read verses 6 through 8. Whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh, Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. What does it mean to carry the keys? Well, part of it is we must be extremely careful in our treatment of other believers knowing that God is their judge. If you belong to Jesus Christ, God has your back. Now, sometimes his judgment takes a long time to work itself out, but it works itself out perfectly. Solomon said, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, the hearts of the sons of men are fully set in them to do evil. But that doesn't mean that God has forgotten or God won't judge. God is the judge and God will judge. And as believers, often we have to be patient because he said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. God is a God of vengeance, but God is a God of perfect vengeance. And we must be a people of forgiveness. But when there is offenses, he says, listen, offenses are going to come. But woe to the man through whom the offense comes. I'm telling you, it were better for him that a millstone were hung about his neck and cast into the sea than he offends someone who belongs to me. So if we share Christ's heart towards believers, then that means we are going to take every measure necessary not to offend one of our brothers or sisters in Christ because God's got their back. We love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Are they all very easy to get along with? Absolutely not. But God's got their back. And so we better do everything necessary to love them and seek their well-being, their edification, their growth, rather than despise and offend. And that's the point of verses 
uh, 10 through 14. So let's read verses 10 through 14. He says again, Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily say unto you, he rejoiceth more over that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. So instead of thinking poorly of others, which can sometimes be easy to do, there's some people that we get along with quite naturally. And then there's some people that maybe rub us the wrong way. It's harder for us to be patient with them. And maybe in a more extreme situation, you know, we just are really tempted to think very poorly and maybe even sin against the other person. So instead of thinking poorly of others, actively seek their well-being and their maturity. And the analogy that Jesus gives is a shepherd with a sheep. Sometimes this is an analogy that might be used for unbelievers, the fact that God loves them and tries to bring them into the fold. But here it's used of believers, that sometimes believers are kind of erring in their, maybe in their manners and sometimes in their decisions. And sometimes it gets hard because the Bible says a true believer will not persist in sin. And that's why there's measures taken. If someone is persisting in sin, there's measures in this passage that need to be taken to protect the church and help evaluate what's going on spiritually in someone's life. But at the same time, we don't want to judge wrong. We don't want to be judgmental. And we don't want to think poorly of others when it really isn't right. And so Jesus says it's like a shepherd. I mean, he loses a sheep. One of them goes astray. The shepherd normally doesn't rejoice when the, the problem sheep, the black sheep, let's say, has left and he's not thinking to himself, I hope it fell off the cliff because it really always did cause us problems. He says, no, a shepherd normally is going to go after and try to bring that sheep back. Now, he might have to whack it a couple times, maybe break its leg or something so it learns. That's a bad idea to go way out there by the dangerous cliffs. But he's going to go find that sheep. Jesus says, this is the way I am with my own because I love them. So if you belong to me and you're one of my little ones, take every measure not to offend one of these little ones, but do everything within your power to seek their good and their well-being, even the ones that have a prickly personality or the ones that we have a harder time getting along with maybe. So what do we do in extreme cases when maybe someone sins against us? Sometimes it's just things annoy us or bother us and we have to learn to get over that. Pray for the person. Maybe there's some things that are, they need to work on and mature in areas. But sometimes in more extreme situations, there really is sin that arises in the church. And that's why Christ gave us the verses 15 through 18. So he says here in verse 15, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. If he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And Pastor Berlin was speaking about this this morning. I thought that's, that's perfect because that's the message for tonight. And he says here uh, in verse uh, 17, if he shall neglect to hear the witnesses as well, then you need to tell it to the church. And if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, now this verse 18 it ties in with what Jesus said means carry, to carry the keys to the kingdom of heaven in chapter 16. This is hugely significant and very basic to the existence of every church. Carrying the keys, using the keys. What does that mean? Verse 18. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth, doing it this way, having this attitude, taking care of problems with this, these methods, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And so God is good in saying, if someone belongs to me, I want things to be done well. It is never right to gossip. It's never right to spread rumors. Even if you think that something might be true, you better be very careful who you talk to about that. Because often it causes divisions and it can cause doubts. Sometimes when we're the problem and not the other person who we think is causing the problem. There was a man in, in our ministry... He's, I, I think he's, he's changed. He's become a, a very loving and productive member of our church. Uh, but um, when he started coming to our, to our church, he really struggled with some of the leadership. And uh, he told me one time, he said, that man, pointing to one of the leaders, I won't say which one, he thinks he's the Messiah. 
Whoa. Now, I know this brother, he does not think he's the Messiah. He loves the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and he's doing his best to serve him. Does he sometimes have maybe things in his personality that come out that sometimes might be misunderstood? Yes. He sure doesn't think he's the Messiah, though. And you know what? The person who told it to me, in my opinion, sometimes struggled with pride. Now, I wasn't going to tell him, I think you think you're the Messiah. I didn't want to start a fight. But those were divisive words because they weren't true. And there were a number of other things that came up that were the same kind of thing. And uh, I was working with him, and I, I finally told him, I said, now, do you think you could maybe do a better job at leading than he is? And he thought about it. And then I, I, I did my best to rebuke him in the love of God. That is absolutely not true. And that does not help when you talk like that. And as far as I know, he stopped talking like that. He said, I know, brother, there's certain things I can talk to you about. There's certain things I better never touch. And uh, I said, Amen. good, good, because I, I don't want to fuel those divisive thoughts and attitudes. In fact, the Apostle Paul, as he was writing First and Second Timothy and Titus, a very specific illustration he gave when you need to do church discipline was he said, a man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject because such a person is self-perverted. Now that word heretic means someone who causes divisions. He says, listen, sometimes you got to do church discipline. It's not usually pleasant for anybody, but when you do, watch out for those who cause divisions. And so uh, I know it, it's pretty close to home because it's very easy to spread things, to say things that are, are ultimately divisive and not helpful. And we have to be so careful that we don't talk that way, that we don't think that way, that we don't live that way. Because it does not promote Christ in our lives or in the church or a good attitude. It's divisive. Um, and so sin does happen sometimes. But he says, I don't want you to blab whatever the issue is to the whole world. Eventually, in worst case scenarios, you might have to tell the whole church. But in most scenarios, hey, you're taking care of issues one-on-one, 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 -on -one, one -on -one, because offenses are going to come up. They're absolutely going to come up. We shouldn't be surprised. Some people think, well, the church, you know, there's hypocrites there. There's sin in there. Of course there's sin. But if we're doing it Christ's way, it won't dominate or control us. But we, through the Spirit of God, will dominate and control, and like the Bible says, make dead the deeds of the body, and we will live. And so we talk to the brother or sister if there's a problem. That's the only way you can really take care of it, really go to the root of the matter. But if they don't listen, we know there's times when some people, some people, times people are stubborn. They either don't believe us, they don't want to hear us. We find one or two other mature believers not to attack the person, but to kindly, in the love of God, the Bible says, speaking the truth in love with one another, they might be able to recognize the harm that's caused through whatever that action or whatever that's, that kind of talk is. But we, it's not, we're not trying to shame anybody here. We love Christ and we care about the health of his church, and so we do, think God's, do things God's way. And in the process, we're protecting one another, we're loving one another, and we're helping one another grow. If someone comes to you or if someone comes to me, I, I never want to despise that person for that be thank, thankful to God that they're concerned about my spiritual growth because that's what it's all about looking more and more like Jesus Christ and so it's nothing to be intimidated about it's something to be thankful to God for because this is our security as believers knowing other believers care about us enough to watch out for us so we properly turn the lock by pra properly practicing church discipline I just have a few quick guidelines for this process uh, how can we effectively carry and use these keys well, first of all, be open to change. Be open to change because there are things we do that can be better. And sometimes there's sin that we simply need to repent of. Uh, the, the Apostle James, the brother of the Lord, said, the wisdom that is from above is first pure and then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, which means, you know, the wisdom that comes from God, it's open to change. It's not like, you know, I've always done it this way, so who are you to tell me I have to change this? I've always had this sin issue, and I, I, I've, I just cannot get over it. Now you're not speaking the truth to yourself. It might be extremely hard, but by the grace of God and with the resources of God, you can. Amen. And it's open to change, this wisdom that comes from God. It's not my, my way or the highway. Now, if it's a biblical conviction, and we say, you know what, I will never change on this, praise God for that firmness. But if it's a problem area... We need to be open to change. That wisdom comes from God. Another practical guideline, practice the presence of God. 
We live in a very busy society. A ton of distractions all around us. But practice the presence of God. Get alone with God. Make sure you're paying attention to your prayer life. Don't neglect your prayer life with God. Meditate on his word. Memorize his word. Another practical guideline is make Sunday special. Uh, if you're anything like us, sometimes we're rushing out the door, and uh, I, I have a, just a ton of things in my mind that I'm trying to take care of or remember on Sunday. And Sunday's a day of rest, supposedly. I know for leaders sometimes it's a little harder. There's a lot of responsibilities going on. Uh, but make Sunday special. One of... Uh, my counselors in life said, hey, it's a good idea. Get your things ready Saturday night and then try to get to bed at a good time Sunday night. You don't have much to worry about and just go with a peaceful attitude with your family, get to church and be ready to hear and receive the word of God. That too is part of this counseling and admonition process that keeps us walking in the middle of the road. Uh, so make Sunday special. Pray regularly for others. Uh, you know, the Bible says, speaking the truth in love with one another, we're going to grow up to become more like Christ together. Uh, but that love sometimes is hard. We're selfish by nature. And um, there are people sometimes that rub us the wrong way. And John said, now listen, the, the Apostle John, he said in 1 John, we know that we've passed from life unto death because we love the brothers. We love them. And just like Jesus gave his life for us, we know that we should give our lives for one another. I mean, if you imagine someone walking in here, you can look at the person behind you, in front of you, on the side, say, now if I had to give my life in this moment, they would take my life so that my brother or sister could live, would I do that? I ask myself that sometimes. I say, boy, I, I don't know. I hope so. We need to be willing at any moment to give our lives for our brothers and sisters. You say, how can I have such a love? Well, it comes from Christ. But as you pray for others... Many of you already know this and experience this. As you pray for others, there will be a love in your heart so that if it ever came, so that you had to give your life, you'd be willing. Be willing because the love of God is shed abroad in your heart and you care enough for a brother or sister to pray for that person. Pray. That's a very practical guideline for getting started in this rich, deep love for others, presenting them before the throne of grace. Uh, find peace in treating others as superiors. You know, the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 2, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other as better than themselves. Isn't that true? Much of our problems come up because we're not really thinking of others in terms of they're superior, they're better than me. If we really have that attitude, we really have to help someone in their spiritual walk, it's, probably, it's unlikely they're going to doubt the sincerity of our desire to help them. It's going to make it a lot easier for them to want to listen to us. But they have to be our superiors in that sense. I care about you. I treat you like you're better than me. Uh, be confessing and be forgiving. Uh, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another so that you might be healed. There's two extremes. We don't want to just be confessing every chance we get all the sins that we struggle with, the temptations we've had throughout the week. Uh, but neither do we want to pretend as if, you know, we, we don't struggle anymore. A healthy church will be, to some degree, a confessing church. He says, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another so that you might be healed. And then be forgiving, of course. Because there are going to be offenses and there are going to be wrongs. And our place is to let God carry out the vengeance um, and be forgiving. And then I have two more for you. Seek to be discerning without being unnecessarily suspicious. We're talking about caring for one another, being alert to any sins that might come up or sins that have affected us. We've been offended. Don't be overly suspicious of other people. Don't be, in a sense, a helicopter Christian as you. As you see the helicopter mom sometimes on Facebook that they're just always hovering and micromanaging and never let their child get a bump or a bruise because they're always just assuming the worst. As believers, we don't want to assume the worst, but we really do want to be alert, just not unnecessarily suspicious of what's going on. Uh, and then, finally, think of confrontation in terms of Proverbs 28, 23, which says, He that rebukes a man afterwards will find more favor than he that flatters with his tongue. It's easy to say, oh, I don't, that's kind of a hard issue to deal with. And so we either talk around it, talk over it, dress the thing with flowers, when really we need to confront somebody or something if there's a real problem area. And you say, boy, confrontation is hard for me. I think it's hard for most people. But this is how favor comes. This is how one even develops respect if you do it with the right attitude to really help your brother or sister in Christ, that's, that cultivates a real respect for you. 
It's better than flattery. And then James reminds us, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, then one convert him. And one is able, through these godly guidelines, to convince somebody, let him know that he which converts a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death, and he will hide a multitude of sins. And so losing your keys to the car, to the house, you know, that's a pain. But it's a much bigger problem if we're not carrying and using the keys to the kingdom of heaven correctly. There's a privilege that Jesus Christ has given us if we've professed faith in his name. By his grace, let's carry and use these keys. Pastor Berlin. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm going to ask a pianist to come to the piano. We're going to, in just a moment, have a have them play a hymn of invitation and give you a chance to respond. Tremendous message on how are you carrying the keys? Are you being responsible? Or are you being careless? Are you being intentional in the way that you're carrying the keys? Are you truly investing in one another, loving one another, praying for one another in our church the way that you're supposed to, the way God is expecting you to, commanded us to, and holding us accountable to a tremendous thought, tremendous message, and I trust that you will apply it and allow the Spirit of God to bear fruit in each of our lives. Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the faithful declaration of it, and I pray that you would do a work in our hearts that would exalt yourself and glorify yourself, that Faith Baptist Church would be made up of precious little stones that are living and obedient to your word, ultimately striving as people view our lives to come to a right conclusion about who you are. And so, God, I pray that you would do what you intended this message to do in each of our lives. May we be receptive and obedient and and responsive to it, we pray in Jesus' name. Heads bowed and eyes closed as she plays a song of invitation. If God spoke to your heart, the altar is here for you. Maybe there's an area that he touched on. Something that you've not been doing in the body. Maybe holding a little bitterness rather than ready to forgive towards another brother or sister in Christ that maybe is a little prickly. Maybe your prayer life isn't as such that it should be. Whatever the need, I trust that you will do business with the Lord. If you want to come to an altar, it's here for you. She's going to play one more stanza, just that believers are doing business with the Lord. Amen. You may be seated.